tonight with a little game of Family Feud. We have two questions. The first question is going to decide which team gets to answer consistently after this. Yeah, okay. The top five answers are not on the board, okay. but that's okay. We got this. Now, you have to wait for me to finish saying the whole question before you smack and try not to hurt Aunt Miss Linda, okay? Just, you know, we'll keep it right in the middle. All right, here we go. First question. <laughs> Linda's like, move it closer to me. Her arm's a little bit shorter, right? <laughs> She's like, I get it. All right. Now, you guys need to be thinking about your answers, but don't say them out loud because your team may need that answer for later, okay? Name something that hinders or destroys the unity of a family. You got to hit the buzzer to answer. Name something, that destroys the unity. Name something that hinders or destroys the unity of a family. First person with an answer, your team gets to play. Can't shout, shout it out? You got to... Oh, he doesn't. You got to touch the buzzer before you answer, though. All right, Linda. I would just say not being truthful. Ooh, not being truthful. No. No. <laughs> I was hoping it'd be more of a buzzer. Anything on that list you think is anywhere close to that? Nah, I don't think so. All right, Willie, you get to try. And if you get this right, then your team gets to play. Um, lying. Ooh. Oh, that's the same thing, not being true. Yeah. Stealing. <laughs> all right, since she hit the buzzer first, and neither one of you got it right, we're going to let their team go. If that's all right. Everybody good with that? All right. She, she went all the way up here to do this, so let's go ahead and let this team play. Normally, we would go to a different way of doing that, but... All right, so you guys can talk among yourselves and see if you can come up with an answer to this. Name something that hinders or destroys the unity of a family. And let's just go down the list. We'll, that would destroy the unity of a family. So lying's not going to be one of them. Um, ah, you're on vacation. <laughs> destroy the unity in mm, of a family. Mm -hmm. A family. Christian or not Christian, doesn't matter. Of any family, it will destroy the unity. <laughs> that is not on the list. He said eating the last piece of chicken. <laughs> Arguing, arguing. No, I'm sorry. Now, listen, we had uh, like 60-some people answering these questions. Oh, wow. So I really did the survey here. So that's your first X. This is not what you taught. This is what a survey said. This is the survey. Oh, okay. We got our music going on back here. This is an actual survey that I did. Mm hmm Oh, you want one for me? Yes. Cheating. Cheating. Yes. Oh, okay. Number three, betrayal or adultery. Cheating. Yes. So you got 18 points. 18 points. All right. So you only have one X. You got two more X's. If you get two more X's, then that team gets to play. So, Josh, if you don't mind keeping track of our point system, that would be fantastic. So we've got 18 points. Okay, Aunt Carol. Divorce, destroying, that would be, hmm. No, mm -mm. not close enough to one of them, I'm sorry. Uh-oh. Abuse? Abuse? We'll take it. Abuse. Now, you get 14 points for that one. That was the number five answers, and there's five answers on the board. So he, you got the betrayal, adultery is 18 points. That was the third one. Substance abuse, any kind of abuse. All right, so now we come back over here. You still, how many X's do we have? Two, 
two. You have one more to go. Oh, one more. If you get another X, then this little vacation crew over here will get it. Name something that hinders or destroys a family unity. <clears throat> oh, you know what that means? Oh, he's got the timer going now. You ran out of time. All right. We got to go this way now. All right, folks. You've got to answer one that's on the board. Not you. You can't, you can't say anything. Okay. Aunt Mary. Oh, no. Name something, anything that hinders or destroys the unity in a family. Mm. You're on a timer, too, by the way. <laughs> Your sisters are giving you such a hard time. Being insensitive? Insensitive. No, it's not on there, but that was a good one. Uh. All right. Money. Money. No. What? These are not the top answers. They have to be the top answers. Now, money is down on the list, but it's like only one person out of like 60 or 70 people said money. All right. Something that hinders or destroys the unity of a family. Fighting. Mm -mm. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. We got the number one answer right here. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is 30 points. 30. 30 points. Hey, you got music. All right. So you guys still have two X's, just two. So you got one more X, and then we're, we're probably just going to take a, you know, do the point system and tell you what the other answers are. Aunt Mary, name something that hinders or destroys the unity of a family. That's a hard question. Lying? Lying? Not, yeah, we already did it, but that one's not, no. Okay, here we go. So what is our points? 18 plus 14. So that's 32 and, and 30. Ooh. Ooh. The other answer, so the first one was unforgiveness at 30 points. Second one, internet and electronics. Believe it or not, 22. Betrayal and adultery was number three. Number four is communication issues. Number five was substance abuse. Some of the other answers that people gave was greed, jealousy, indifference, lies, gossip, secrets, negativity, stubbornness, anger, lack of God in the family, expectations, not having dinner together, midlife crisis, and poor boundaries being set. Poor boundaries. All right, we need two more people, one from each team, to come up and do the buzzer. And this is the last question. <laughs> Josh is all into the music over there. All right, Justine, who's going to come up against Justine? All right, Rick, here we go. <laughs> oh wow, it does. Yeah, he's trying he's trying to distract you with this jacket talk, right? So put your hands right here on the on the thing. And when you know the answer, after I'm done reading the question, just smack the buzzer. Are you ready? Name a reason that a family would not go to church on Sunday morning. Yeah. Give an answer. <laughs> There's so many answers. 
sleeping. Sleeping. Sleeping in. Yes. Number three, that would be 19 points. Now, if she can get one that's higher than your point, then she can steal it. All right, girl, what's your answer? Stayed out late last night. Oh, yeah, that one's not on here. But that would make you want to sleep in the next morning. <laughs> That was a good one. That was my answer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, y'all have a seat. We're going to let Rick steam. So each of you guys have had an opportunity. So that was 19 points. Only day off, and they want to sleep in. Hmm. So your timer starts whenever I ask the question. Oh, am I first? Yes. This time you'll be first because oh. he just went up and hit. We're trying to give everyone just a chance to. So name a reason that a family would not go to church on Sunday morning. Working. Believe it or not. And again, I did the survey. I did it on Facebook, and you should have seen all the crazy answers I was getting. All right, Aunt Mary. The reason the family would not go to church on Sunday morning. <laughs> Your sisters will mess with you. <laughs> Why don't you want to go to church on Sunday? <laughs> Anybody? How about no love for God? <laughs> oh, you're on vacation. <clears throat> he, he's on vacation now. Oh, buzzer. I would hope, but yeah, but he, he kind of put his hand up, time was up, so... You're on vacation, you can't. <laughs> Isn't it terrible when you're on the front row and someone asks you a question? Now you know how I felt the day Pastor Bob was asking me questions, and I'm like, <laughs> what What's was your that? Name? Ah, it's hard to do when someone's right there at your. All right, okay, Mr. Willie, name a reason that a family would not go to church on Sunday morning. Mm, I'm going to go with lack of interest. Lack of interest. Number two, maybe? No. We're, okay. We said, judge says no. Sorry. It was a good try, though. Now, remember. Yeah, I know, right? He's, she's like, wait a minute. His wife's on the other team. <laughs> no, really, it doesn't match up as close as I would like for it to. <laughs> All right, here we go. All right. Name a... <laughs> Name a reason. That was three X's, right? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you for someone keeping up with this. Hold that thought. We'll be back. All right. Who left off over here? Don't believe in God. Don't believe in God. Number two. Ding, 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 ding. 20 points. 20 points. Not religious. Don't believe in God. And they have disbelief. Disbelief. All right. And that was number two, and then they got number three. Only day off, wanted to sleep in. Okay, who's next? Are we going this way? This way, okay. Um, there's hypocrites in that house. Hypocrites, number four. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> 16 points. Now, just know that even if, if you guys get three X's now, they might be able to steal all the points over here. Yeah. So, uh -oh. I don't know. I don't think we can go back that way, but we'll see. All right, name a reason. That a family would not go to church on Sunday morning. Any family. Can't get everybody dressed and ready. No. Sorry. We got an X on that one. So that's your first X. Okay. Name a reason. Someone is sick. Someone's sick. Sickness. Number one answer. <laughs> the illness. 23 points. 23 points. All right. We've got two more answers on here and one X going on. All right, Aunt Carol. Name a reason that a family would not go to church on Sunday morning. Not allowed to? Forbidden? No, that was not an answer that anyone gave. That's interesting, though. Not allowed to. There's a lot of families who have, you know. All right. Uh -oh, I'd rather be fishing. 
Oh, that was an answer, but not the top six. <laughs> Sorry, that would be two more X's. All right, so that's three X's. So. Oh, that's three. Okay. All right, and since we went back, and we, we need to go ahead and end up on that because we did the same thing with the other team. We want to be fair and not keep going back and forth. Sorry. The top answers. Illness. Not religious. Don't believe in God. Disbelief. Only day off. Want to sleep in. As Linda said, hypocrites. How about number five? Lazy. Number six, vacation or out of town, thus going to the beach, but she kind of put that out there a little bit too late. I might have actually brought that in if it wasn't a little late. Some of the other answers we got, family conflict, everyone fussing at each other, and then all of a sudden, well, we're just not going to go. Work, feeling uncomfortable, or I'm sorry, feeling uncomfortable or don't feel welcome no clothing to wear, vehicle issues, moved and can't find a church. We had a few people who said that. Sports, gas money, and that was spoken by a couple of people who infrequently visit our church. They don't have enough gas money to get here. Priorities, maybe the family, you know, have something to take care of your family that came first. Offended. Too much preaching about tithing and money. Hangover, but it wasn't the top six. <laughs> Can watch it on television. Guilt. They don't want to come in here when they got sin in their life. Too busy. A death in the family. Fishing. And they're Jewish. And they don't believe in coming to a church on Sunday. Okay. Those were your answers, all right? Everybody go have a seat. Well, first of all, what were our point system? 91 to 49. 91 to 49. That's good, though. Good job, guys. Woo-hoo! Dun -dun -dun. Dun -dun 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 -dun. All right, everyone, you can have a seat in your regular positions if you would like. All right, so that just kind of gives you an idea. No prizes this time. But that was fun. What wasn't fun is you had, but you guys had one of your sisters over here on this side, and all the other sisters over on that side. Y'all done dog ain't Mary and left her over. <laughs> oh. She was adopted, that's right. Mr. Frank's got it right up there now. That is so funny. Yep. We hope to do something like this again in the future, maybe on a family night or something. We'll, we'll see what we can do where it can be a little bit more formal, a little bit quicker, and kind of have fun with it. So, here we are, week four, I am a church member, Dr. Tom S. Rayner. One of the reasons I wanted to start off with our little family feud is because what we're going to be talking about this week has to do with our families actually being a part of the church. So we are going to start off by looking at a little review of what we've done so far. So far we've covered our introduction, the tale of two church members. I think everyone in here has heard that, so we're just going to read through it. The first chapter was, I will be a functioning church member. And it talks about all the different giftings we had. That's why we passed out our gifts assessment. Is the next screen will show you all these multiple gifts that everyone has. And I hope you guys are talking about this among yourselves. Like, oh man, I found this out or I found that out. I've actually had a couple of people come to me already and said, wow, I didn't know that that was one of my gifts, but it makes sense. They're very interesting. Chapter 2, I will be a unifying church member. We learned in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5. It, or love, does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when someone does it wrong. And that was our foundational scripture for that chapter. Chapter 3, I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. The scripture that we pulled out for that chapter was 1 Corinthians 12.25, that there should be no schisms in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. We found out that that word schism means a gap or a split, a division, a rent, 
not like rent you pay for your home or your apartment, but a renting like the tearing. A primary verb meaning to split or sever, to break, divide, open, rend, or make a rent. <clears throat> then we moved on to chapter 4. I will pray for my church leaders. 1 Timothy 2, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Now, we have many members here at the Shield of Faith who are either ordained as teachers, ministers, pastors. We have multiple people here in the church that are ordained. Now, with this in mind, I want to clarify again our church leadership per the directory. Last week, I, it was brought to my attention by more than one person that I made a couple of mistakes in the way that I labeled people. And I apologize for that partially. I just, my brain was out of it. But for whatever, as ministers, we, we don't walk around and say, well, my title, you know, I'm a minister. I'm a rev. If they can't see it in our walk and in our talk, we shouldn't have to announce to everyone that. As ministers, we want to make sure that everyone here at the Shield knows who the leadership is in our church. So I'm just going to read through the list. Of course, we know pastors Bob and Susan Tilton. And again, I've listed their spouses as well because, again, they're a part of the ministry and a part of the, the energy that goes forth in the different areas. Ministers Frank and Linda Butler. Minister Michelle and Floyd Dodder, Head Elder Rick and Missy Knoffel, Deacon Charles and Rachel Ferguson, Deacon Willie Preston. Please pray for us. Chapter 4, pray for your leaders, pray for their families. Then we moved on into chapter 5, which is what we're doing today. I will lead my family to be healthy church members. One of the questions is, what are one of the reasons why people, you know, a family wouldn't go to church on Sunday morning? Well, as men, as women, some families, we have couples where we have the husband and the wife. Well, the husband is the one who is going to be the responsible one when it's all said and done as the authority in the home. Hey, why, aren't your, why weren't you going to be a part of the body? Why weren't you using the gifts and the talents? Why didn't you encourage your family to do the same? So there's a sense of responsibility and we know that we're all corporately the church we have our our brothers and sisters next door that meet on sunday we have all these churches throughout charleston we are all corporately the body of christ but for today we're going to talk about individual churches you know even paul did that paul wrote how many letters to how many different churches so there really is something to having these church, you know, talking about individual church bodies and their functions, okay? So it's very important to understand that. So as we're going through this chapter, just keep in mind that, yes, each individual church has its own giftings and callings, but yet we're still part of the corporate body. And as we do that, and, and I just want to remind everyone, too, that, you know, one of our goals here at The Shield is to help strengthen families, one of the reasons we don't have church service on Sunday evening, to encourage everyone to go home, spend quality time together. That's not time for us to go and, and work, but to have time to spend with the family to encourage one another and build each other up. Amen? I'm going to read what Dr. Rayner had in the first part of this chapter. I thought it was really amazing. He was talking about a man who was in his church, and his name was Bob. <clears throat> he says, his name was Bob, he died a few years ago, but if he influenced just a few people like he influenced me, this relatively unknown and quiet man changed the world. Bob always seemed to be at church. I understand that some people show up at church every time the doors are open, sometimes out of guilt or legalistic obligation, but not Bob. He was always joyous, always serving, always kind. You could just tell he loved serving the church. The same could be said about Bob's wife and his two sons. 
They too seemed to love the church and to find joy in serving. The whole family was, well, different, but different in a good kind of way, if you know what I mean. I was a young businessman in my early 20s, and I had been married for three years, and I had just become a dad. Fatherhood hit me like a ton of bricks, and I wanted to be a good husband and a good dad, and that meant getting involved at church, really involved. I didn't know it at the time, but Bob was watching me. He was concerned for me. He loved my youthful enthusiasm, but he knew what was coming. The more I got involved, the more I would see the imperfections of the church, the pastor, the staff, and other church members. Bob had seen the pattern repeatedly. Get excited about church. Get more involved. Discover the imperfections of the church. Get discouraged about the church. Leave the church. Bob took me under his wing. When I would begin to get angry or frustrated or discouraged about something at the church, he would talk to me. And I want to pause right there. We are going to have many people that come in that get discouraged about the way something's ran or the way we do things or or anything about the church. And we as a body of believers and as a strong church family are to encourage them like this man Bob did. Hey, look, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And encourage them to keep coming, to keep feeding on the word, and to keep drawing closer to the Lord. He would explain that no church is perfect, no pastor is perfect, no church member is perfect, and he would gently remind me that I was not close to perfect either. He told me that we were to find joy in serving the church and those in the church. We were not a part of the church to see what we could get out of it. We were part of the church to serve and care for others. Our perspective should always be on giving, not receiving. And if someone did something that disappointed or frustrated us, that was God's way of telling us to pray for that person. So when we get frustrated, think of it that way. That's God's way of saying, pray for that person. Pray for that person. Bob told me that we could never have the perfection of Christ. You know, that 100%, I'm just, just exactly like Christ. But that we could strive to be more like him. He reminded me that Christ died on the cross for people who rebelled against him. We should be able, therefore, to love the seemingly unlovable at our own church. Through Bob's patient biblical teaching, I learned to love the local church. I learned to love the people despite their imperfections. Bob would teach me to look at the log in my eye, in my own interpretation, or my own imperfections, before I judge the speck in others' eyes. I wish my own parents had taught me how to love the local church, but Bob was a good spiritual father to me. By the way, Bob's two sons are grown men now, and it's no surprise they are serving and loving their local churches just like their dad. After all, he taught them well. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and look at that scripture in Matthew 7. You know, in the family feud game, we all had to work as a team in order to win the largest points. We, you know, had to talk to one another and try to figure out, you know, what we could do to get those biggest points. And we need to remember that we are a family. Yes, you have your family when you go home, but we are a family. These bunch of folks meet up in the woods to talk about the Lord and how wonderful he is. We are a family. And I feel that more now than ever. And as we learn about each other and we learn what each other's needs are and we serve one another, it draws us closer and closer together. Let's go ahead and read in Matthew 7. And we're going to read from verse 1 through 5 for those of you taking notes. Do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemn yourselves. For just as you judge and criticize and condemn others, you will be judged and criticized and condemned. And in accordance with the measure you use to deal out to others, it will be dealt out again to you. Why do you stare from without at the very small particle 
that is in your brother's eye, but you do not become aware of and consider the beam of timber that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me get that tiny little particle. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me get, get, get that little piece out of your eye. That little, little bitty piece that I can't see because I got a big old thing stuck in my head. Out of your eye when there is the beam of timber in your own eye. You hypocrite. First, get the beam out of your own eye. Then you can clearly see to take the tiny particle out of your brother's eye. And it has been said that those who find things wrong all the time, two things. They've never been happy with themselves. The very thing they're pointing out in everybody else is the very thing they struggle with. And the second thing is the way they were raised because that's what got them to that point. A parent who can never find something positive to say about their child. It happens. It happens. When we hear a message at church, are we constantly thinking about the person that we think that that message is for? (laughs) Or are we thinking about, well, that message is for that person that causes all the issues. Or do we ever really stop and apply it to our own lives? You know, Willie is up here preaching his heart out. Folks, he has walked through stuff you will never know about. You will never understand. Thank God you will never understand some of the places he's been. But I'm telling you, if you hear his heart, he's going to be teaching again this coming Sunday to close up everything. Thank you, Pastor Bob, for letting him bring that to a close because I'm excited to hear about the other parts that he's got over here. But if we take the word and we apply it in our own lives, because the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. brethren. Oh my goodness, can we get a hold of that? When we're doing that, whose side are we on? that's That's scary to even think about. You know, kids will learn how to love unconditionally by watching their parents and other people in the church. They will learn from us. They'll learn to love the church if they see us loving the church. We teach them right. It's going to cause them to have longer-lasting marriages, longer-lasting relationships with church families. There's something to be said about conflict with people. Conflict resolution. If Aunt Carol and I got into it and I was like, girl, those shoes look like my shoes. I've been missing my shoes for two months and I think those shoes are my shoes. You know what she might say to me? Good luck trying to find them in my closet. (laughs) Anybody knows Aunt Carol, she's got a beautiful selection of shoes. But you know, if I hold that against her because in my mind I think She's got my shoes. Now, those are my shoes. But if I think those are my shoes, and I hold that grudge, I'm accusing her in my spirit. And there's no clearness. There's a wedge in that wall that God wants to build. That wall he wants to build, us fit jointly together, that's strong. There's a gap there now. And there can't be gaps. Sin separates us from God. Anytime, one of the questions on, you know, people not coming to church is if they feel guilty. The second we do something wrong in our human nature is to just kind of, well, I'm not going to pray as much. I don't feel close to God. or I'm not going to read my Bible as much. And so this gap starts. And what God wants us to do is build our family. Draw from each other. When you're weak, pick up the phone and call someone to pray for you. Nobody's an island to themselves. We, we need each other. I need you to encourage me. I need you to correct me. I, if I don't, I'm, I walk around not knowing where I'm going. Or I won't know if I've hurt you unless you tell me. 
Maybe I need an area in my life that needs to be corrected so I don't wound somebody again. I need you. You need me. We need each other. And it's very important that we listen to one another. Another thing we need to listen to is we need to listen to ourselves talk sometimes. Do we even hear the words that are coming out of our mouths? What fills our mouths? And that will give you a little bit of a glimpse of the area that God may be working in your life. If, if we're always talking about how sick we are and I just can't get enough drugs to fix this thing, well, guess what? That's the area you need healing in. If you're talking about, you know, just how wonderful everything is, guess what? You've got a spirit of joy, and people are going to want to be around you all the time. They're going to draw from you. One of the things that, we're, that I found in reading this is we need to be thankful. We really need to be thankful. I thank God for my pastor and his wife. I thank God for the leadership in this church. I'm telling you, the things that we have walked together as a family, if we really sat down and wrote it down, we, we really could write a, a whole library full of books. I've been here 21 years now. Almost 22. Wow, I've been here 22 years already this year, right now. I started coming here in January, 22 years ago. And many of you were here when I got here. So your numbers are even bigger than that. That shows faithfulness, steadfastness, a desire to know one another, a desire to know God, to continue to come here and learn. I, I, how many churches can we walk in and see that kind of caliber of people who are still moving forward in God. They're not complacent sitting on the pews, like a lot of churches, oh, I've been going here for 40 years. Oh, wow, what are you doing? What do you mean? I come to hear the word. But here, you can ask any person sitting on any of these chairs out here, so what you doing? And if you don't tell them, somebody else is going to jump in and say, oh, I, phew, this person is doing this and that, 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 that. Because we know each other. Amen. Let's be positive and encourage each other. There's something the Holy Spirit showed me while I was going through this, this chapter that will tear the family apart, that family unit. And I'm talking about the individual families. And then I'll talk about the church again. Let's talk about our individual families. Let's get real personal here. Are we constantly telling each other what to do in our own home? Spouses. I mean, I've been guilty of this, folks. I'm not telling you something I've never done. I mean, I've been guilty of this, and God has really done a work in me with this. We can't constantly point out, you're not doing it right, you're not doing it right, you're not doing it right. We need to be positive. How many of you will take the challenge tomorrow to not tell someone else how to do something. Now, if you have children and they're running out into the street, please tell them not to go out into the street. But within reason, let's not demand that, well, you really need to do this because that's the right thing to do. I don't really want someone hovering over me telling me what to do every time I breathe and walk. That's, a, that's an element of control. And we have to be careful with that, that we don't put each other under bondage, because what happens is this, and I've lived through this at, with, um, at home, when a person is constantly telling you what to do, you become a robot, and then when God asks you to do something, you respond in fear, because you're afraid you don't want to do something to upset the person that's been telling you what to do all this time. So we need to be very careful to give each other space to grow. Don't put each other in such a, a box that they can't grow. Amen? Amen? Let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 25. I have a special video um, that um, I would, would love to have actually brought forth right now, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to do it because of the, the, um, the drive. We, we need time to actually work with it. So what we're going to do is try to maybe work after the service or first thing on Sunday to see if we can get this video. But it really ties, Willie and I both saw it, it really ties messages together 
of what we're teaching here and what Willie has been teaching. So Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. Just love them. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5, 33. The wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband. Not just respects, but delights. Hey, I'm so glad you're home. I've missed you today. It's so good to see you. They'll be like, whoa. Whoa, what happened there? Oh, my goodness. If we could do just those two things, if the husbands could love their wife and the wife could respect and delight in her husband, oh, isn't it? It really is. Let's, let's go on. I, w- I would like to read this in Ephesians 6, verse 4. Let's, let's talk about our children. We just talked about the wife and the husband. Let's talk about the simple thing that God gave for the fathers when it comes to their children. Fathers, do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Okay, wait right there. How many of you were irritated by your father or provoked in a neck? Do not raise your hand. They are filming Do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment. Because that's the progression. You irritate them. They get provoked. They get angry. They feel exasperated. What is the next thing? They start resenting. They don't want to be anywhere near their fathers when that happens. But, rear them tenderly tenderly in the training and discipline and the counsel and admonition of the Lord. Telling a child, don't do that, do this, don't do that, but in a tender way. Honey, that's really not good and this is why. Now, I'm not a perfect parent, but there's some things I've learned by reading the word. Tenderness and love will cover their heart they will want to come to us and talk to us about what they're going through in school, what they're going through in their life, and it will continue on through adulthood. All right. I'm going to read, and this is going to be um, page 59 and 60. This is the closing portion of this uh, section in this book. We have about six minutes, so let me make sure that I bring this to a good close here. And this is, again, in our, uh, I am a church member. These passages that we just read remind us that just as we are supposed to sacrifice and love our families unconditionally, so we are to love those churches where God has placed us. Our family members are not perfect. Neither are the members of the church. We are to find our joy in serving both our families and the church. So the struggles we go through at home are no different in our interaction and communication with each other than when you're in the church. But when you're in a family, you may not have enough money to leave home. You know what I'm saying? You can't just quite easily leave as much as you would like to leave a church. But it's the same concept in learning to live with one another. Our family members are not perfect, neither are the members of the church. We are to find our joy in serving both our families and the church. We are further reminded of the importance of the family to the church. We are to encourage our family members to be faithful to the church. We should pray together as family members for our churches. Pray together as a family for our churches. Indeed, As we are to strive to love our families more deeply, so should we exhort our family members to love the church more deeply. There are two things that he says are very important for our individual families to do. Number one is praying together for the church. He says, one of the many lessons I learned from Bob was to bring my family together to pray for my church. Following Bob's leadership, I would learn to pray the leadership of the church in a number of ways. For spiritual protection, for protection from moral failure, for the preaching of the word, for their families, for encouragement, for physical strength, 
for courage. How many of you need courage? You may think it, oh yeah, well Michelle's up there teaching, it's so easy for her. Hello? I was 18 when I first started teaching behind a pulpit, and even today I still have the jitters. And I have to pray, turn off everything, close my eyes almost every single time and say, Lord, it's you, not me. I will not fear their faces, like Jeremiah said. I'm doing this because God has called me, not because me has called me. For discernment, for wisdom in their leadership, as my family grew, we would follow the pattern that Bob taught me. As our family prayed together for our church, my three sons grew up with a love for the church. See how Bob impacted his life and now impacting how many other people. They were not blind to the problems and the challenges that occur in any church. They did learn, however, to love people unconditionally, and in doing so, they learned to love the church. Part of the opportunity and honor of being a church member is the teaching of our family to love the church. And that teaching often begins by praying together as a family for the church where God has placed us. The second thing he mentions that we should do together is worship together. We come here in the sanctuary individually and we corporately come together and we praise the Lord. How many of us are doing that at home? on a regular basis, turn on the music, worship the Lord, raise your hands, letting your children see, I am worshiping the Lord right here in my house. It's not just for church. Bring it into the home, because when it's brought in the home and then you come to church, you're bringing that atmosphere of worship into the church, and it's only going to get stronger. It's only going to build the atmosphere and open the windows of heaven for God to come in here like a flood. It starts at home. You might say, well, I'm single. I really don't have anybody to pray with me for the church or with me to worship with me. Folks, single people, call us. Come on over to our house. We'll have a prayer meeting. Just call and say, hey, I want to have a prayer meeting at your house. <laughs> I'll bring the goodies. Can you tell me what time to be there? Or couples, let's call some of the single people and say, hey, we're going to have pizza and popcorn and worship the Lord tonight. Come on over. Let's have fun. Let's include one another. And don't forget the ones who are single parents or single, you know, and, and need others to worship with them. All right. Let's go ahead and stand for our fifth pledge. A couple words to say while you guys are standing. If our family gets discouraged or discontent in our church, we will remind ourselves that unconditional love is not always easy. Can I say that again? Unconditional love is not always easy. But we will also remind ourselves that unconditional love has been demonstrated perfectly for us. And his name is Jesus. He loves us, sins and all, so much that he died on a cross for us. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we are all saints in the Lord, still having mistakes here and there, let's still love one another. Amen? That's a character of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Let's say our fifth pledge together. I am a church member. Everyone say it. I am a church member. I will lead my family to be good members of this church as well. We will pray together for our church. We will serve together in our church. And we will ask Christ to help us fall deeper in love with this church because he gave his life for her. He gave his life for the church. Amen? Amen. Amen.